Om Aganati Marandasya Anganangana Sadakya Chaksur in Miritam Yena Tajamai Sugiri Vedamaha Shi Chaitanya Manovi Stam Savitam Yena Bhutare Sayam Rupa Karamayam Dratti Saparantikam Mandeham Sugiru Siyata Parakamanam Sugiru in Vaishnavam Sha Si Rupam Sagadutam Sahagana Raganatam Bitam Stam Sadevam Sadvaitam Savarutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Siddhartha Krishna Paran Sahagana Larita Shivishikan Vitams Cha Nama Om Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pastaya Bhutare Shimadi Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tanamane Namaste Sarasati Devi Guravani Pacharine Nirvishesa Sunivari Paskita De Sadarine Si Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shi Advaiti Giradha Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Narayanam Navaskitam Naram Chavala Rotamam Devam Sarasatim Vyasam Tito Jayore Let Nashta Priyashu Bhajesu Nityam Bhagadesi Bhagati Atamashuki Bhakti Bhavati Nashtaki Nikamaka Puru Karitam Param Shukamakar Mita Dravi Samatam Pivata Bhagatam Rashamara Mahora Hora Shikabuvi Babukaham Anjali Radhe Sham Jimmy I know a few others that have already scrolled out of my sight. Thanks so much for joining this morning. Govinda Dave. <clears throat> We've got some nectar to churn this morning in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, 2nd Chapter, 14th verse. <clears throat> we'll just get right into it here without any further ado. Tajmad Ekana Manasa Bhagavan Satpatam Pati Srotavya Kirtitav Jasa Mala. Good morning. Deus Pujas Tanityada. Therefore, with one pointed attention, one should constantly hear about, glorify, remember, and worship the personality of Godhead, who is the protector of the devotees. The operative word here is kitatavya, which is translated to mean glorify. Of course, um, another translation of kirti is to, is to chant, kirtan. But here it's used in the terms of glorifying. So it, our foundational practices are Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smadaram. First of all, we hear and then we chant. In one sense, the chanting or the Kirtan or the glorifying is more important than the hearing. It's acknowledged that unless you hear properly, you're not going to be able to glorify. However, the point is that the purpose of hearing is in order to be able to glorify. In other words, you're getting filled up with the power, the empowerment, the knowledge, the wisdom uh, of bhakti, of devotional service, with the purpose of your then being a light to others. There's no place in the scripture where it indicates that having received this knowledge, it stops with you. You're supposed to just lock it up in the basement somewhere and sit on it. <laughs> of course, that's what India did for many thousands of years. And when Indians started coming to the West in the 60s to pursue engineering degrees, not one of them brought bhakti with them. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ordered every Indian, Bharata Bhumi Te Hadi Manusya Janma, everyone who's taken birth in Bharata Bhumi, to spread the science, to learn it, first of all, of course, you can't give what you don't have. So in order to spread the science of Krishna consciousness, you have to absorb it and assimilate it yourself. You have to make your life perfect and then pass it on to others. But nowhere does it say that you should hoard it. And that was virtually what India did for many, many hundreds of years, to say, simply sat on it. So the whole purpose of hearing in other words, the indication or the sign, the test as to whether one's heard properly is whether one's going to then take what one's heard and share it and spread it to others. In other words, as your life is blessed by this knowledge, then you have to then go on and become a blessing for others. <clears throat> so there are two purposes. One is for personal purification and the second purpose of Shravanam Kirtanam is to broadcast it. If you only hear and then don't pass it on, if you don't glorify it, 
One thing is that your own realizations will be stunted. They'll be limited. The nature of this commodity, of this merchandise, is that when you pass it on, it increases. Your original stock increases. Imagine you were a businessman and you had some commodities that you wanted to distribute. And imagine if the more you distributed that commodity, the more your warehouse, instead of emptying out, filled up. That would be a businessman's dream come true, wouldn't it? Well, that is the case with Krishna Bhakti. The more you distribute it, the more it grows and matures and blossoms within you. It's just the nature of the knowledge. So you cannot keep it to yourself. You cannot hoard it. You cannot sit on it. Bhakti Siddhanta used to severely criticize whom he called false pretenders who make a show of hearing and chanting in a solitary place, imitating Haridas Thakur. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Setting that bad example of taking the holy name and isolating it, uh, separating it from society in general. Bhakti Siddhanta went so far as to say that even though they're wearing Kunti Mala and Tilak and chanting Hare Krishna in a solitary place, because they're not on the level of Haridas Thakur, they're pretenders, and insofar as they're misleading people in general, they are described by Bhakti Siddhanta as agents of Kali Yuga itself. In the Bhagavad Gita, towards the end of the text, towards the end of the conversation, when Krishna's basically had his say, he says to Arjuna, this is the 72nd verse of the 18th chapter, so one of the very, very last verses of the entire Gita. Kachit etad shrutam parta tya tyaka grahena chetasha kachit angana shamaha panashtas te dananjaya. O son of Prita, conqueror of wealth, have you heard this with an attentive mind? And are your ignorance and illusions now dispelled? So there's a subtext here. When Krishna asks Arjuna, have you heard it? What he, mean, what he means to say is, prove it to me. Show me. Indicate that you've heard it. In other words, Krishna is saying to Arjuna, what are you going to do about it? Krishna doesn't say, well, Arjuna, now that we've had this conversation, uh, why don't you go home take an afternoon nap, sleep on it, wake up in the morning, tell me what you think. No, oh, he's, he, he's, Krishna has just poured in all 700 verses of the Bhagavad Gita into Arjuna. Arjuna has heard it with rapt attention. And now Krishna is saying, the ball's in your court. What are you going to do with this knowledge? And Arjuna doesn't, fail the test. He passes the test with flying colors. Basically, he says, Everything that you said to me, Krishna, I totally accept as truth. He says, My lethargy, my self-centeredness, my illusion is now destroyed. Nashda, it's shattered and it's now behind me. Uh, now I am, everything's clarified and I'm fixed according to your instructions. My memory is now again and Kadisha say, Bacharam, Tava, this is it. This is the result of hearing that now I am prepared to act according to your instructions. That's the, that's the sign that you've actually heard, that now you're about to act. Otherwise, if you just go on hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing, it's like um, eating. You know, you may eat very well, good nutrition, take great care to avoid unhealthy foods, take whole grain foods, fresh foods, eat as much as you like. But then with that energy and those calories, you never do anything with it. So what's the use? 
even though you're eating well, because you're expending fewer calories than you're taking in, the result is that you'll become unhealthy. You'll get excess weight. You'll become lazy. It'll be hard for you to get out of bed in the morning. So it's important to expend as many calories as you take in in order to maintain an optimal level of health. Similarly, we're not meant to just sit and hear and hear and hear and hear and hear. The very nature of this knowledge, the seeds in us that the knowledge plants, inspire us to action. They incite us to action. We cannot keep this to ourselves, in fact, without being thoroughly connected. Imagine if you alone knew the cure to AIDS, if you alone knew the cure to cancer, and you kept it to yourself, you never shared it. You'd be culpable, you'd be criminally liable, you'd be put in jail for that. See what I'm saying? <clears throat> so when Krishna asks Arjun, have you heard this, and are your ignorance of illusions now dispelled, what Krishna is saying is, are, we, are the decks cleared now for action? Are we at our battle stations? And Arjuna says, yes, we are. Kalisha say, Rajanam Tava. There's the instruction of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself in Madhya Lila, 7th chapter, 128th verse. Yare deke tare hakaha, Krishna upadesh amara agne guru hai. Tata Edesh. Instruct everyone to follow the orders of Sri Krishna as they are given in the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. In this way, become a spiritual master and try to liberate everyone in this land. So it's not just that Krishna spoke to Arjuna, and it's not just that Arjuna is the only one who's supposed to strike out and act according to Krishna's instructions. Krishna is instructing each and every one of us through Arjuna. And if we've heard the same message that Arjuna's heard from the disciplic succession descending down from Krishna, then Krishna is asking you the same question that he asked Arjuna. And he's waiting for the same sort of response. Have you heard this with an attentive mind? Mitravinda, have you heard this with an attentive mind? Sundari Priya, have you heard this with an attentive mind? Joe, have you heard this with an attentive mind? Are your illusion and ignorance now destroyed. Okay, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with this knowledge? And if you do what you're supposed to do, what Krishna intends you to do, the benefits are incalculable. You become the cream of the cream. Again, the very end of the Bhagavad Gita, 69th verse, Na chatajman manusheshu kashtid me priyakita maha bhavita na chame tajat for one who spreads this message and alleviates the suffering of people in general by sharing the knowledge of Krishna consciousness, Krishna says, there is no soul more dear to me in this world, nor will there ever be anyone more dear. It doesn't get any better than that. So those who are eager to get the mercy of Krishna they take up the baton of missionary work. Anyone who claims that Hinduism or Vaishnavism or Chaitanyaism has nothing to do with missionary work is doing everyone a great disservice and doesn't really even begin to know what they're talking about. Krishna consciousness is first and foremost a missionary movement for saving the suffering souls in this material world. Maya Sukhaya Bharam Ubhato Vimura. Prahlad Maharaj, one of our great acharyas, says that for myself, I simply have to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And I merge in an ocean of nectar. And so for myself, I have no desires, I have nothing to ask. But I am, un although I am happy personally, I am extremely unhappy because of these souls who are taking this illusory maya as all in all and getting washed away by the waves of illusion. And I am simply praying how and when and where can I lend them a helping hand. And in fact, Prahlad and all devotees' mood is that they don't, although they've earned liberation, they're automatically liberated 
because they're engaged in the spreading of Krishna consciousness, they don't want to cash in on their liberation unless and until all living beings have preceded them back to home, back to Godhead. So we'll continue here now with Prabhupada's purport to this verse in the second chapter, first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. If realization of the absolute truth is the ultimate aim of life, it must be carried out by all means. If any of the above mentioned castes and orders of life, in any of the above mentioned castes and orders of life, the four processes, namely glorifying, hearing, remembering, and worshiping, are general occupations. Without these principles of life, no one can exist. Activities of a living being involve engagements in these four different principles of life. Especially in modern society, all activities are more or less dependent on hearing and glorifying. Any man from any social status becomes a well-known man in human society within a very short time if he is simply glorified, truly or falsely, in the daily newspapers. Sometimes political leaders of a particular party are also advertised by newspaper propaganda, and by such a method of glorification, an insignificant man becomes an important man within no time. But such propaganda by false glorification of an unqualified person cannot bring about any good either for the particular man or for the society. There may be some temporary reactions to such propaganda, but there are no permanent effects. Therefore, such activities are a waste of time. And what happens when we take that principle of glorification, we have a big advertising budget, and then we make false propaganda uh, about the glories of a certain unqualified uh, person. What to speak of being materially unqualified? And people that we glorify in the media, the radio, the newspapers, the television, the internet, they're not even devotees. They're anathema. Uh, they have antithopy to the process of devotional service. In fact, in our secular atheistic society, the, those who are themselves lacking in God consciousness are disproportionately elevated and glorified. So here in the Mukunda Malastotra, it is said, O Srinath, Narayan, Vasudev, Krishna, kind friend of your devotees, Chakrapani, Padmanabha, Achuta, Kaitabhari, Rama, Padmaksha, Hari, Marari, Ananta, Vaikunta, Makunda, Krishna, Govinda, Damodara, Madhavi. Although all people address you, still they remain a silent. Just see how eager they are for their own peril. So if you're going to take this principle, which is extant throughout human society, of glorifying and advertising someone, you have to do it for Lord Krishna. If you've heard the Bhagavad Gita, been the recipient of the Vedic knowledge, and instead of turning that back and glorifying the Lord, instead of giving back what you've received, you're silent on the subject of Krishna, but you talk about Bollywood stars, you talk about politicians. It is said that you do so only at your own peril. If you're silent about Krishna, when you need Krishna to speak up or to intercede for you, Krishna's going to be silent about you. If you're ashamed to brag upon, if you're ashamed to identify and comport yourself as a devotee of Krishna, then Krishna's going to be ashamed to identify and to associate with you as well. Therefore, it's very important that you take that natural tendency in society to glorify and advertise something and direct it towards Krishna consciousness. Only by wholesale kirtan, which means to say glorification of that Supreme Lord from whom all good things come, will the very dire situation of the modern day society begin to alleviate itself and turn around. Otherwise, what is the main business of people Nowadays, that was predicted thousands of years ago in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Again, in the first canto, a little bit further on in the fifth verse, uh, fifth chapter, tenth verse. Nayad vichastita param harayasho jagat povitam pagadin tad bhayasham tirtam ushanti nanyata nayatra hamsha naramanchi shikshayaha. So, those who have been beneficiaries of the parampara the knowledge coming down in the disciplic succession, they are, by definition, fortunate swan-like men. They have received the essence of all knowledge, the essence of all 
dynamism, the very active principle of the living being. So they should not have any interest in mundane topics, glorifying personalities based on the flesh and the mind. They sh should separate themselves from such places of pilgrimage for crows. There are two types of men. There are swan-like men and there are crow-like men. Crows are never seen where there are beautiful waterfalls, beautiful greenery, and clear pools of water with lotus flowers. That's the abode of the swans. The crows have no interest in such rarefied atmosphere. Crows will always be found uh, on the side of the road, scavenging, picking the dead flesh off of the bones of roadkill. Similarly, it is said, those words which do not describe the glories of the Lord, which do not glorify and advertise and promote the Lord, who alone can sanctify the atmosphere of the whole universe, are considered by saintly persons to be like a place of pilgrimage for crows. Since the all-perfect persons are inhabitants of the transcendental abode, they do not derive any pleasure there. They do not derive any pleasure from churning topics that have to do with the gross body and subject mind. The language may be beautiful. The language may be decorative. The language may be full of alliteration, similes, meter, and poetry. And yet with all of that, if it does not glorify the Lord, it's considered no better than the decoration of a dead body. And spiritually advanced men who are supposed to be of the category of swans, do not take pleasure in such dead literatures, which is a source of pleasure for men who are spiritually dead. I can't recall the verses to my mind, and probably we wouldn't want to introduce those verses into a subject matter of today's talk. But uh, if you want to research it on your own, I think one of the best examples of beautiful, beautiful meter and poetry and verse uh, and vocabulary being applied to the most ridiculous, the most mundane, the most dead subject matter is, uh, I believe it's Christopher Marhalo's uh, To a Koi Mistress. Look that up if you want to uh, see the penultimate example of all that art and knowledge and learning simply wasted on a subject matter which is hardly merits the <laughs> handicraft that's lavished upon it. Uh, Ode to a Koi Mistress, Christopher Marlowe. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again encourages us over and over and over again. Adi Lila here, 9th chapter, 39th verse. Distribute this Krishna consciousness movement all over the world. Amara Agnai Guru Hai Tara E Desh. Let people eat these fruits and ultimately come free from birth, old age, and death. In the 10th canto, 83rd chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and this is also described in the Krishna book, Krishna's queens are conversing amongst themselves. Draupadi actually is the inciter here. Draupadi um, has uh, five heroic devotional husbands amongst the Pandavas, and she's just explained how it was that she got to marry each one of her husbands through the Shrayambar and Arjuna shooting the fish uh, suspended on the ceiling. So she then asked the queens of Krishna how it was that they uh, were so fortunate as to be uh, joined to Krishna in uh, eternal wedlock. And so one after another, the main uh, eight principal Krishnas of, queens of Krishna tell their stories, starting with Satyabhama, Satyabhama's father wanted to make sure that nobody but Krishna could win the hand of his daughters. And so therefore he said, only that person who can subdue seven ferocious bulls will win the hand of my daughters. And when the other kings and princes got into the arena, tried to subdue the bulls, they, all they got for their efforts was <laughs> wounds and broken arms and legs and black eyes. But Krishna very easily went in and he, he's in the heart of every living being. So... Within the twinkle of an eye, he had all the bulls eating docilely out of his hand. And then uh, Lakshmana described how Krishna again shot a fish just following 
In the same way that Arjuna had won Draupadi, Krishna also shot a fish by looking at a reflection of the fish in the ceiling. Jambavati describes how Krishna fought her father, Jambavan, the powerful uh, uh, um, pri primate, for 27 days, after which Jambavan offered his daughter in marriage to Lord Krishna. Rukmini uh, also described how it was that Krishna whisked her away during the Shrayambar and kidnapped her, and there was a running fight afterwards. Rohini Devi then spoke for the other 16,000 queens, described how they were all captured by Bomasura and held in his palace. And then Krishna came and liberated them all. And after Krishna freed them and said, now you can go back, they said, we don't, we don't want to go back. Uh, the only thing we ever wanted was to be your eternal servants. And so please, we've, we have no other shelter. We have no other place we want to go. Uh, so we ask you, please accept us. And Krishna married all 16,000 queens. Now, the reason I bring this up is that the one thing that each and every queen had in common, none of them had ever seen Krishna. They were, in that society, the young girls and the wives were cloistered. Many of them had never had the sun touch their skin. But when they went out in public, which was rare, they would go to palaquin with curtains on each side. And so they had no direct experience of seeing or hearing Krishna. Every one of them wanted only Krishna as their husband. Why was that? Because some or other, from servants, or cooks, or security guard, from who knows what humble people spoke to them about Krishna. What humble people did kirtan, glorified Krishna to them. And in doing so, a seed was planted and nourished in the hearts of these great, great, I don't know what you call them, mahatminis, mahatmainis. So that they then had a desire exclusively to serve and to worship Krishna. So who were these people? We don't know their names. But I'll tell you one thing, you may not know their names, but Krishna knows their names. And not only does Krishna know their names, but Krishna says, none are more dear to me, nor will there ever be anyone more dear than those who simply whispered into another's ear about the glories of Krishna. And so we all have those opportunities. We may be high, we may be low, we may be in labor, we may be in management, it doesn't matter. We may be at the office, we may be at the gym, we may be at the golf course, we may be uh, at Yosemite on a vacation, we may be online on the internet. One thing you'll see during this uh, lockdown period, when there are no mass gatherings, there are no public assemblies, you're seeing the devotees everywhere you go, live on Facebook, on Zoom, it's been an explosion of kirtan, an explosion of kata. One time Prabhupada was challenged by a professor from Berkeley University. He says, the scriptures don't say anything about kirtan. And Prabhupada said, the scriptures are full of kirtan. When you take kirtan, not just to mean Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, with symbols and madanga, but when you take kirtan to mean glorifying, the whole heavens and earth, the three worlds, material and spiritual, will resonate with kirtan, with glorifying the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And everywhere you look on the internet now, devotees are stepping forward and they're doing kirtan. And so if you're out there in the audience and you're one of the many, many thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of people who are fortunate enough to be recipient of this knowledge, then think about how you can then as your light, life is blessed and lit up and enlightened, how you can then pass it on to others. The result, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, if the fruits are distributed all over the world, my reputation, and he's understating it obviously here, the Lord is capable of tongue and cheap as well as we. He says, Lord Chaitanya says, my reputation as a pious man will be known everywhere and thus all people will glorify my name with great pleasure. 
And here's a statement I referred to earlier. Bharata bhumiti haida manusya janma janma sharte kakara para upakara. Earlier we said those who take birth in India are ordered specifically by the Lord to spread Krishna consciousness. But Bharata Bhumi is not strictly translated as meaning present day India. Bharata Bhumi te in the traditional meaning means the whole earth planet. Now that means any of us who have taken birth anywhere on the earth planet are being personally instructed by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to make our life successful, to be very diligent in terms of our hearing and chanting. And the more diligent you are in terms of hearing your chanting, then the more effective is going to be your work for the benefit of the rest of the living entities. Continuing here in Adi Lila, ninth chapter, it is the duty of every living being to perform welfare activities for the benefit of others with life, wealth, intelligent, and words. By his work, thoughts, and words, an intelligent man must perform actions which will be beneficial for all living entities in this life and the next. Lord Chaitanya again, pursuing his mood of humility, finishes up this group of verses by saying, I am merely a gardener. I have neither a kingdom nor very great riches. I have simply some fruits and flowers that I wish to utilize to achieve piety in my life. And I'll tell you a story which at one and the same time shows how we should not use our words lightly. We should not speak gossip. We should not criticize others, especially in a public forum, especially devotees, no matter what perceivable faults they may have. It is the worst thing to go public online with criticisms of those who are chanting and spreading the holy names of the Lord. So here's a little story uh, about how at one and the same time one should not allow injudicious critical words to escape one, especially in a public forum. And at the same time, one should desire to spread those words, Uttama Shloka Varya, which glorify the transcendent Lord. So one time a man went to his pastor and he said, Pastor, he said, I need your help. He said, I have a problem with gossip, but what can you tell me to do that will cure me of my habit of gossip? The pastor said, oh, that's easy. I want you to take a feather pillowcase and go up to the topest, top, highest mountain in the county this afternoon, cut that pillowcase open and open the feathers to the wind, then come back here tomorrow. Next day, man dutifully appeared in the pastor's office, said, I did it, pastor, what now? The pastor said, now you go and collect all of those feathers. He said, what? He said, I was on top of a mountain. I, it was windy up there. There were thousands and thousands of tiny feathers and, I over, and the wind took them every which way. How in the world could I possibly recall, how in the world could I possibly recover and pick up those feathers which are just spread all over creation now? And the pastor said, you see my point. You see my point. When we speak something, we cannot recall it. We do not know in all the various places it is gone and to how far away it's blown and how many ears that that sound vibration has entered. Once you let it out of your mouth, you cannot recall it. You cannot undo it. So make sure that what you speak, especially those things you speak in public, are going to hit their mark that they're going to glorify the transcendent Lord. They're going to be a benefit. They're going to be useful, they're going to be needful, and they're going to be beneficial to all living beings. Otherwise, you speak at your own peril. So continuing here and finishing up with the purport by Srila Prabhupada. The actual object of glorification is the Supreme Personality of God and it has created everything manifested before us. We have broadly discussed this fact from the beginning of the Janmani Yashya Yataha Shloka of the Bhagavatam. The tendency to glorify others or hear others must be turned to the real object of glorification, the Supreme Being, and that will bring happiness. In Bhagavad Gita, 9th chapter, 14th verse, Krishna says, Satatam kirtayanto mam yatantas cha dhidavata namasyantas cha mam bhakcha nitya pasha pasha te. Always chanting my glories. 
endeavoring with great determination, bowing down before me. The great souls perpetually worship me with determination. And we all have a tendency to glorify. So when that tendency of glorification is there, it must be used and directed towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is really the only worthy object of glorification. Praising His holy name, His eternal form, His transcendental qualities, and His uncommon pastimes is the number one business of a living being who's interested in benefiting himself, his loved ones, and his generation. One has to glorify all these different aspects of the Supreme Personality of Godhead after the ways of the great Mahatmas. One of the many, many benefits that one derives from glorifying the Lord is that one does it in a happy mood. The process itself is not difficult, it's not onerous, it's not laborious. Everywhere there is glorification of the Lord, whether it is verbally in the form of a discourse like mine, or whether it's in the form of chanting your japa, or whether there's musical instruments involved, every single aspect of it is happy, shukam, it's joyful. There are no severe penances and austerities involved. You can live this life as a householder, as a businessman, as a yoga teacher, as an artist, in devotional service. There are no hard and fast rules for chanting. There's no particular vocation or category which is required to achieve the highest perfectional stage. The only thing you must be careful to do is avoid the four sinful activities, illicit sex, gambling, intoxication, mediating, and allow yourselves to be guided by an expert spiritual master. Once you have those elements in place, then from any position, either as a householder, or a sannyasi, or a brahmachari, in any position, from any place in the world, you can glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead and thus become a Mahatma or a great soul. Now, all the great Acharyas, Ramanuja, Madhva, Chaitanya, Saraswati, Thakur, and even in other countries and other times like Muhammad and Lord Jesus Christ, what they all have in common is they extensively glorified the Lord by chanting in every single place. The Lord is all pervading, and so those words of glorification go out like feathers to all the points of the compass, to the ears of innumerable, uncountable living beings. And you may be a streeper in the street, but at the same time, you have the opportunity to achieve greatness, because wherever you go, whomever you meet, benefit them. Put the drops of Krishna consciousness. I remember my own story starts in the same way. I was being spewed out of a subway station, downtown Sydney, in the winter 1970, uh, through Winyard Station, and I caught a glimpse of color out of my eye, and there was Upendra, one of the first two missionaries to arrive to Australia. And I went up to Upendra, I'd already been to India, and I recognized his dress, the teal I mark on his forehead, and I said, what's this all about? And he said, love of God is a dormant seed within everybody's heart. And so from those first words that Opendra said to me, uh, the seed of devotional service, something rose up from within me and resonated. And so I'm here today before you, trying to pass on that light, trying to pass on that blessing that he injected in my ear about 50 years ago. And so you try to do the same thing. If we're enlightening you, if we're resonating with you in any way, shape, or form, then you try to do what the great Acharyas have done, is simply pass on this great knowledge. Don't let it stop with you. Every single elevated, liberated souls have it in common that they have glorified the Lord in all places, in all circumstances, and to whomever they met. The Lord himself is eternal throughout all time and spaces. He's all pervade. He's within everyone's heart. He's within the atom. He's the master of time and space. Therefore, etad nidyabhadanam ijatam akutobayam yoginam nipadam hari namanu kirtanam. There is only really one imperative for those who have the human form of life having taken birth on the earth planet. And that imperative is that everywhere and in every time, the Lord must be remembered 
and his holy name must be heard and glorified. That, Prabhupada says, will bring about the desired peace and prosperity, which is so desperately awaited by the people of the world. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you for being with us, Chris, Pavani, Mala, and so many others that have scrolled before. I'm just doing this on my phone, so I don't have a big screen to read all of your comments. But if you have a question or anything, you're welcome to type it out, and then I can type an answer back to you if the answer requires something more elaborate. Perhaps we can bring it up tomorrow. But thank you all for being with us. I certainly myself feel transcendentally enlivened in your association. I look forward to these Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday Srimad Bhagavatam classes each week at 7.30 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.